Okay, uh, after Dad passed away, going back to Kansas was never the same. There was never a pinochle game as soon as we got there and a pinochle game right before we left. But that didn't stop the pinochle games. When we went back, why, uh, Bob would come to town and we'd have pinochle. Or uh, later, when we were uh, staying after Mother was gone, we stayed over Betty and Ron's uh, and parked the motorhome in their alley. More pinochle. Bob would come in there and we'd play. And of course, we always go into St. Saint, uh, Francis for a game. And uh, we went to Morse and Irene's place and we played... Uh, Oh, two or three different kind of cards and pina always pinochle. And then we played pinochle here at the Moose Lodge. The camper club uh, always had pinochle. So from the time I was eight years old till right now, we still play pinochle. So uh, that was one of the main things we done. And then talking about going back to Kansas and so on, uh, that was of course, our favorite place to go. And uh, one thing we did was go to the school reunions. And I think they had two before the folks moved to town. Joanne had come from Wisconsin, Joanne and her family, and we'd be there. And so the cousins got to see each other uh, pretty, uh, pretty often. And now these reunions, the first one we went to, uh, Don and uh, Kenny stayed out on the farm <clears throat> with the kids while Joanne and I went into the assembly. And I don't remember for sure whether we went back out to the farm and then came back to town or whether they just come in town we met when we met them. But the first one we went to, they had the dance out at the uh, agricultural hall out of the fairgrounds. And it, it it was it was crowded, and Harry James was the orchestra. He came down for Denver, and a good a good orchestra, of course. But there were so many people that hadn't seen each other that if you saw anybody anybody you wanted to see, you just stop in the middle of the dance floor. Sometimes it'd start with two couples. Sometimes it there'd be ten or twelve people all in a circle. But anyway, it it was it was a great time, and we had uh, a class meetings, and the assembly. Nobody except the alumni could go, and, and then they had the class meetings, and then the next night, uh, why well, it was just kind of a get together here and there, and they only had one dance, and then five years later, with the Oh, same place out at the agricultural hall, and that time uh, I think it was Tommy Dorsey played another name band, and it was just about the same. And <clears throat> that that place was big, but it wasn't holding them because sometimes for these unions or uh, reunions were over five thousand people between four and five thousand people would show up, and that at about triple. Uh, triple the population of Goodland at that time. And um, the folks were still on the farm and the kids were still out there, but they were getting a, a little bit a, a little bit older. And I don't know how mother and dad took care of kids all, all evening and part of the next day, but they did. And that one was about, about the same. We danced that. And after that one, the reunions... They opened uh, the Vets Club. We could dance there or the uh, what they called the Field House. And that's where they had the assemblies. And uh, once again, uh, of course, we were, the folks were in town by that time. And one night we went home and Mother said, there's kids on the floor from two years old to 20 years old. And instead of going to... Mother had two extra bedrooms, some of them could sleep in, but they didn't. They all just laid on the floor and slept, and we went to the motor home. And to this day, I don't know where going back that everybody slept like they 
it or even if even if they did sleep, mother and dad were probably glad when it was all over. But they never ever complained and wanted all the kids there. And Judy, I think uh, she of course she lived in town, but I think she went out and spent most of the time out on the farm with them while they were out there. I don't think Marguerite and uh, Jay ever went to a reunion, but of course there was a a lot of days as went through there by this time, and <clears throat> uh, I, I kind of felt sorry like for Jean's wife that didn't know anybody down there. They were just more or less they were there, but they you know didn't what was going on with anybody else and so on, and a lot of a lot of reunions. Um, and it seemed like more and more people came each each year. One year, we were at the foot started at the field house, and um, Kenny and Don I think spent half the evening sitting out on the lawn because it was so hot in there. But of course, Joanne and I had to be in to see what was going on. And that night it was kind of uh, different. Uh, Marguerite had passed away before then, and uh, two of her boyfriends asked, and they never asked me before in my life to dance, and the whole time dance I was with them was asking about Marguerite and her family and and so on, so I said, well, it was a uh, remembrance of Marguerite, I guess, more than anything. Uh, Betty and Ray, uh, Kenny's brother and sister, they, they, uh, they never went to any of the reunions, but we didn't, we didn't miss any of them. Uh, after we moved uh, the motor home town in front of Mother's house, why my friend Loreen, she came and stayed with us a couple nights. And so it was, it was just, just a, a great time to, to re go. And we went, I think we might probably went to, uh, Oh, five or five or six of them, and uh, <clears throat> then flying flying back. I oh, I, uh, I think we got so that we knew every bump in the road and every air bump there was that we went so many times. Uh, one time, when we went back, why we went a different road. We went down and going to Grand Junction on the way. Why? We went by uh, down through Pueblo and so on. We'd never been that way before, but we went that way to see uh, Ruby and uh, uh, Ruben Peter that we hadn't seen for quite a while. And he had got his leg hurt on the uh, machinery that he was working on, and it, it was it was a bad it was a bad. Cut. He couldn't be on on his feet. He was in a wheelchair, and when we got there, uh, of course, they were kind of surprised to see us. And Ruby was getting ready to change the dressing on on Reuben's leg, and she hated to do this. So Kenny said, "Well, let me let me do it. Let me see if I remember how." So, of course, being a paramedic in the Navy, well, he thought he knew how to do it. So they took the wrappings off and he doctored it and put it back on and he said, well, I guess I still couldn't know how. And Reuben said, that bandage looks better than when you left the hospital. So Kenny says, yeah, I guess I still got it. So anyhow, we went on down there. Uh, another time when we were down there, we talked about going to the fairs. We went over to St. Francis to the fair and we knew that uh, Paul and Mardell were going to have to work, her in the booth, and St. Francis had its own carnival, and uh, their volunteers ran it. So Paul was helping run the Ferris wheel, and a neighbor that we'd had, Keith uh, Lloyd, he and Kenny had a cousin to, to, together, and he, Kenny hadn't seen this cousin for at least 40 years. so. Well, they were running that, and being in with Paul, they kind of talked about getting acquainted and everything again. And Paul told me, he said, I think your friend from Bird City's over uh, at where they're having an auction, 
selling off the uh, 4-H livestock. He said, I seen her going over towards there. So I said, well, I told Kenny, well, I'll go over and see if I can find Mardell. So, uh, I mean, uh, see, Lorene. So I walked over and it was in front of the, the grandstand. And I looked in, in the bleachers. I seen her sitting in there and the auctioneer was going on. And, oh, I don't know, I suppose there was anybody that had any, uh, wanted to buy anything was there or if they were selling their project, the folks and the kids were in there. So I don't know, I suppose maybe there was 40 or 50 people in there. So I walked up to the steps to where they were in this walk down the, the center thing to see her. And she looked up to see me. And when she saw me, she was standing right uh, in front of the auctioneer's thing. And she stood up and she just yelled, oh, my God. And the auctioneer quit. And I know he thought something bad had happened. And everybody was just looking around, and she come over, and of course, when we saw each other, why we had to do this hugging and was to tickle to see each other because it had been, oh, four or five years. And so I don't know what the auctioneer, he, he said something about uh, reunion or <coughs> something. I'm not sure what he said. But anyhow, we watched the rest of it till her nephew's uh, pigs were sold. And then the, this nephew was about uh, 14 years old, and she introduced him to me, and she said, this is one of your dad's old girlfriends. And so, you know, he kind of twisted and turned around. He said, well, hello. And I said, are you as good a dancer as your dad used to be? And he said, no. And I told him, I said, well, uh, tell him I said hello. And... Uh, the ironic part of it is that his dad was one of the guys that we took from that wreck uh, years ago. So I'm sure sure he remembered who it was. Uh, another fun time we were there, why, uh, we just got back and went straight to Goodland from, from St. Francis. We came down that way this time. And um, they were having a birthday party for... A lady that was, I think it was her 90th, and anyway, she was neighbors of the folks out in the country, and I knew that if we went to Canarada, we'd see a lot of people I hadn't saw for a long time, and Kenny had got to know quite a few, and um, so uh, we uh, I took the motor home from the, our, our car and drove over to Canarada where this uh, birthday party was going on. <clears throat> And we parked right in front, and people were going in and out of the senior centers where it was. They were going in and out of there and kind of walking up and down the street. And uh, when we got there, why, Tick Doggett and uh, two of his friends were sitting on the window seat out in front. And we hadn't saw Tick and Vera for, oh, I don't know, several, several years. So I told Kenny, I said, let me go over and see if Tick knows of me. And so I got out of the car, and I walked down past these three guys. And, of course, they weren't paying any attention. They were just talking among themselves and watching people, I suppose, go in and out. Well, I walked on by them, and they never said anything. So I turned around and come back, and Tick was sitting between these two guys. When I got right in front of him, I leaned over, put my arms around his neck, and kissed him on the cheek. He had no—I didn't say a word— I just walked on by, and I could hear these guys. Who was that? Who I took? I haven't any idea of what's going on. I haven't any idea. That's all I could say. I have any idea, or I don't know. Well, I just walked on in and went on into the center, and um, Kenny walked over then in front of him. And as soon as he saw Kenny, why he knew who it was, and. And so I walked in and told Vera what I'd done, and she laughed, and she said, oh, I'd like to see that. Well, pretty, just a little bit, Kenny and Tick come walking in, and Dad said, what happened to you out there? And he said, your daughter made quite a stir out there. And so uh, we spent the rest of the evening over there with, 
with them. And uh, <clears throat> that was one of the things that uh, went on over there. We went to um, Cheryl's wedding back there. We went to several anniversaries. We went to the folks' uh, anniversaries. And I always call us, while Grandma was alive, I always spent some time with her in Eula and uh, Francis at that time. Harvey and George had both passed away. And uh, Francis uh, would never move to town, even if she got older and Bob worked in town. Bob uh, was working in town after he got out of the Merchant Marines. And she stayed out there. And she insisted on doing Bob's shirts. He wanted to take him to the laundry, and she said no. That was her job, was to do the washing and ironing. So she did that until uh, she got, uh, it wasn't Alzheimer's, but it was, I don't know whether they called it dementia or what, I don't know. Anyway, they put her in a, a nursing home uh, there in town. And the bad part of it was, that if Richard or Jean would come down to see her, which wasn't, you know, real, real often, was well, she'd always know them. And Bob, who she saw every day, she didn't recognize half the time. And uh, so anyway, I I went up to, to see her, and she was sitting out in front kind of where, where they entertained people or visited with people. And I walked in, and the minute she saw me, she called me by name and said, come on over here and sit down, and we'll talk. And so I went in, and I spent probably oh, over an hour with her, and we talked about, oh, what well, was growing up, and about her cookies, and about 4-H, and about just about everything. And you would never, ever know that there was anything at all the matter until... I got ready to leave, and I told her goodbye, and she said, well, if you see George or Bob downtown, why, tell him I'm ready to go home. I said, okay, if I see him, I'll tell her. Well, then, we were going to go home in two or three days, so I went back up to tell her goodbye, and uh, the nurse said, well, you can't see her today. She didn't feel good this morning, so she, she's still in bed. She's not getting up, and I said, well, I want to see her anyway because I'm leaving for Oregon <clears throat> and I want to go in and tell her goodbye. So they let me go in her room. She recognized me right off. She said, I'm not feeling good today, so I'm I'm just not going to get up. And I said, well, you know, you just stay in here and rest. And I imagine, oh, it was less than a month later, I would say, Maybe maybe two weeks at the longest. Why, then she passed away, and Eula. Uh, she was still at home, and she lived to be a hundred and two, and then. Um, <clears throat> but I I did go see her, every, uh, every time. Uh, most of the time when we went back, we only had three times that I could remember any difficulties, and. The first time, Kenny was still working five days, so we tried to leave before, or uh, two days early, and then come back two days later, so we'd end up with with uh, nine or ten days rather than just the five. So we usually drove straight through. Well, this time we started through, it was winter time, and we started through, I Imagine it was Wyoming, and and it started to snow, and uh, we stopped at uh, one filling station, and in town, and, and got some gas. And the farther east we went, the worst the snow got, and then we had a, a ground blizzard, and you could not see anything, and we'd gone on by another little town. And uh, if there was a car, a car, which thank goodness there wasn't very many, you can just barely see the lights right before they got in front of you or the tail lights of a truck. We did fall over for a little ways. Well, we just went by 
another little town, and Kenny said, it seems to be getting worse. I think we better turn around and go back. Well, I was glad to hear this, but I was also scared because you couldn't tell where the greater ditch was or how wide the road was or if anybody was coming from any direction. But uh, he was a good judge of distance, and we turned around, and we went back, and, and there was on the, on the edge of this little town why there was a filling station and a uh, motel, several motels there. And so they did have room for us, and it was, oh, probably 1 o'clock in the morning. So I, I think we only had Nancy and uh, Linda, Nancy, and Mike with us. And so we went in and, and just got one room and thought we'd get up pretty early and leave the next morning. Well, when we woke up the next morning, of course, snow was everywhere, but the sun was shining bright. And so we loaded up, got ready to go, and the car wouldn't start. And Kenny looked at underneath it, and he, he didn't know. So the guy that ran the uh, filling station called a mechanic, and he came down, and he said, uh, I think he got some bad gas. He said, maybe wherever he filled up last was the bottom of their gas tanks or something. So they drained out all the gas and I guess blew out all the lines. I don't know what they did or do something with a carburetor. Anyhow, they worked on it for a little while and put fresh gas in and the car started right off. And we went the rest of the way. So maybe it was a blessing that the snowstorm turned us around and we came back or we'd have got stalled someplace along the way. Another time we started to uh, go back home by Grand Junction and we got south of Burns somewhere and we ran into a swarm of some kind of bugs, flying bugs. They were about, oh, maybe the third of the size of a miller, but the, the road had even got slick with them. There had been so many run over and they hit the windshield so bad that the windshield wiper wouldn't hardly keep them off. They came in the grill, uh, uh, the grill of a car, uh, or the we were in a. I think we were in the motorhome at that time, and anyhow, we went down to, got down to a junction. We could either go on to California or turn and go east to uh, Utah, and there was a line up there using the water pump, well, or the water hose. Well, just the water wouldn't take that off. They had to, I don't know, they were using vinegar and uh, window wash and all kinds of stuff. And, and even uh, oh, some little scrapers to scrape that off. So every, everybody was getting it off of their windshield and their sides. And as long as we had that motorhome, every once in a while you'd see some of those bugs. They were on there so thick that... Uh, I don't know, it only lasted about five miles, but they were really, really thick. Uh, another time we went through, we got caught in a hailstorm, but we were lucky enough that it was an either, I don't know what they called it, I called it under a bridge, I think it was a overpass or something, and there was four cars of us in there, and it hailed quite a little bit, so we stayed under that bridge thing till it quit. And some of those people I know had never been on ice or so before because they went skidding every which way away. And one of them went out clear over to the side of the road. The hail was pretty deep, but it was still raining and it, it was melting. And so anyway, we, we got through that one. And I think that was the very same trip that, uh, trip that we got, uh, oh, probably 70 miles from from uh, Midland. And it was, we, we intended to go on through at night. It was, uh, yeah, on through. We'd have been, been there probably by midnight. But anyhow, uh, there was a terrible-looking cloud coming. And... Uh, we pulled off 
this little, it was just a little town and it was all dark. And we went in there and there was a, um, looked like a, a high school building. And we parked on the other side of the street. And right beside us, this pickup followed us in and it had all kinds of antennas and everything with us. And come to find out, it was a, a storm chaser. And he pulled up beside us and uh, wanted to know where we were headed. And we said east, but we were going to stay all night there if it was all right. He said, oh, it's fine. He said, uh, I live over here in, this, in the schoolhouse. He said, me and my mother bought that. And he said, so we've got some, base, uh, some bottom uh, rooms. And he said, there is a sheriff that paroles every once in a while. And if he stops and, and tells you you can't stay here, why he tell 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 him to, that you'd already talked to me, and if he had any questions, come over and wake me up. So, uh, but he said, don't go on it, don't go on any farther east because they said they are expecting <clears throat> a bad storm before morning. Well, I don't know whether they had the storm or not because we were up pretty early and gone and. He was already up. He waved goodbye to us, and, and uh, we went on on down the road, and and no no more problems. And that's the that's the only one times that I can remember that we ever ever had any trouble going back and forth. Uh, after Kenny passed away, why, or I mean, uh, Dad passed away, why? And he told mother, he said, uh, we'll be back in, in July or the 1st of August and we'll take a trip to Wisconsin. He said, we'll call and see when it'll be the best time for Joanne that, that we'll come. So, and, and we did. I think it was probably, probably the middle part of July that we went back. Went back and packed, picked up mother and we went and to Kansas City the first night and stayed all night with Larry Bell. And it was raining when we left, when we left Mother's. And uh, we got to Larry's and we, uh, I guess probably, it takes about eight hours to drive down there. So I imagine we got there early evening and we stayed all night and probably half of the next day, well, it showered that morning. And uh, so then we went on, and I guess it was Iowa, Iowa or Ohio. I don't know those things back there. Iowa, I think. No, Ohio. And anyway, all the way back that we ran into uh, corn country, corn country, and they had these big corn crops, and it was just like looking straight down the road. You couldn't see anything but corn. Now I could look at wheat fields all the way, and it wouldn't bother me a bit. In fact, is I'd like to see that, but corn when you couldn't see nothing but corn all the way down the road, and so I don't know. Well, I guess whether it was that day or the next way, uh, we were driving. It was toward evening, and we were going to stop uh, at this roadside uh, park. It was off the road a little bit, so we went up there. And there was nobody at the gate. And when we went in, why, there was only one uh, um, motorhome there. So we went back and parked it in. And, and uh, that guy said, well, that they were there for the evening. So we visited a little bit, ate dinner. And all at once, we were seeing lightning. And then the thunder came. And you couldn't imagine a worse lightning and thunderstorm we had that night. Sparks flew off of the electricity, uh, electric lines and so on, but we survived. And the next morning, why, uh, Kenny said, well, we'll see if we can find the people that run this or the manager, because they had a, a pay place to come in, and, but there was no place to leave your money or anything. So we drove down the uh, road, it was off of the highway a little ways, and uh, they said, oh, well, don't worry about it. Sometimes they're to collect money and sometimes they aren't. He said, just 
considered a treat for the state. I think it was Iowa. And so the, the next night we got into uh, Wisconsin and uh, Joanne and Don, uh, I think it was a girl's college or a girl's school or something. Anyway, Joanne uh, worked in the office and Don did the maintenance for the part. So we kind of teased Don about Joanne being his boss, but that's the way it was. I mean, she took people in and, and it did the bookkeeping and everything for him. And Don did the maintenance if they had any trouble. Why? Don took care of it. Well, I don't know how come we didn't sleep in the motorhome that night, but we didn't. We had a, Kenny and I had a, a, a bed in one of these girls' dorms, and mother was in Joanne and Don's place. So, anyhow, we stayed there, and I think the first night we went to. I don't. I don't think it was a casino. I, we played bingo. That's what it was, and it, we went to. A, it was kind of a Chinese restaurant type place. In the back of it, they played bingo. So I don't think any of us won very much. But Kenny don't like bingo anyway. But anyway, we played. We played the bingo, and then the next uh, day we went through. Uh, I called them kind of like a greenhouse thing or a Quonset. And then there was, oh, it must have been four, four of them. And, all, and each one of them was filled with different kind of plants. Well, Joanne and our mother and I thought it was great. Joanne was kind of, oh, okay, it's okay. And let's say Kitty and Don tolerated it. But mother and I thought it was great. I mean, well, I, I imagine we spent two or three hours there. And Mother and I could have probably stayed longer and Kenny accused us of taking the little pieces of the flowers off. Of course, we weren't known for that, but they thought we were. Maybe if we'd have been a little closer to Oregon where they'd have lived, why, it might have been true. So anyhow, uh, we saw uh, Shelley and, and Connie and uh, I don't remember seeing uh, Terry, but we sure, surely did. And we saw uh, maybe Ricky's kids. We stayed out there and saw them. And then we went up to Green Bay where Rick lived. And uh, I think we just spent one night there with them. And then we headed east toward, or west, I mean, towards going home. And anything along the road there was to see, we saw it. We, uh, I was, we went through dairy country, and I think that was coming up there. And uh, we saw these big barns and pastures and so on. But you know, it was, it was Wisconsin and so on. We never saw one cow, not one cow, not whole dairy country. But anyway, we uh, when we went through there, why we saw. This rock, I don't know what it's called, it's out in the middle of nowhere. And there's a story about a bear chasing Indian kids up on top of this rock. And it's, it was big, big around, and it was really, really tall. And uh, they had the story that the bear chased the, the Indian kids up on top of this. These looked like bear claws going down the side of this rock. And it, it was a tourist place, but... Uh, you could walk around, you couldn't go into thing. All you could do is look at it. And then we saw, uh, I don't know if it's what mountain it is. It has the presidents carved out, the four presidents. We saw that, and then we got to uh, the Corn Palace we saw it. And <clears throat> I don't think much of any other place until we got to... Uh, I must imagine it was probably well. In, anyway, I, we went through we went we went through Yellowstone, and going down one of the steep hills, or I, I called it a little mountain, steep hills anyway, in the Yellowstone. Why? 
We just barely, barely missed a deer. I, I think Mother could have reached out and touched it. Cause she rode in the front seat and I rode on, I'd crochet and so on. And Kenny always said Mother was a much better traveler than I was because them two saw everything, everything along the road. But anyway, then when we got to Spokane, Washington, why um, their sister lived there. And I told her, I said, you know, we've been gone 14 days and it's rained either in the night or the morning every day since we left home. And she said, well, <laughs> it won't rain today because she said, this is Spokane and it never rains in the summer. And do you know it rained the parade out that day? They had a parade in town, and, and it rained it out. Well, we stayed up there a couple of days with them, and then we uh, went on down, and, and Mother's relation around Salem, we seen it. And uh, then we uh, got home on down to, <clears throat> down home, I guess. And Mother, it was probably, the first part of August, maybe the second week. And so she was with us probably till school, st <coughs> school started. And uh, I, I, I taught that year. And so she flew home to Denver and Ron and then picked her up. Uh, another trip we had, this was when, when Dad was still with us, why, uh, we, it, they, they came out and Mike was stationed at, uh, I said, uh, Santa Ana, I believe he said it was, that where we were. And anyway, we went down to see, uh, um, see Michael and, and Paul. Michael was just a, a baby at the time. And so the folks went with us and, uh, Linda and Steve. And uh, we went, to, we got down there, and uh, Mike had told us, uh, don't go across the street, because he said, it's, it's not safe out here. I said, well, Steve's already gone across the street. And he said, well, Steve will make it fine. He said, just don't you be going out uh, along there. So anyhow, Mike had a couple, three days off while we were, while we were there. And one place we went to was to see uh, the Queen Mary. Now, I don't know whether it ever sailed and it was one more or not, but it was docked, docked there, I think, permanently. So we went through the St. Mary's, and uh, uh, Linda and Steve went th through that pretty much with us. Linda could walk on, on, on it, and I think she was in a wheelchair. But anyway, when we were going through there, there was, uh, I think, three or maybe four guys. They were playing the ukulele and the guitar. And when we walked by them, why, he, they were they were singing these songs. And we kind of stopped there and listened. One of them put his hat, he had sailor hats on. He put it over on my head, and he said, come sing with us. I said, well, I don't sing, but my mother does. So he took the hat off my head and put it on mother's and come sing with it. And she did. She went over and he said, what would you like to sing? And I'm not sure. I think one of them uh, was uh, my Wild Irish Rose, I think, was one of them. And, and the other one might have been, let me call you sweetheart, or anyway, it was old songs. And she sang sang with them. And... and uh, she thought this was great. Well, I don't know whether this was kind of a park or what, but we weren't too far from the Blue Goose. That I can't even remember his name right now. That built it or flew it, and Dad had read all about it. And this was this big airplane that just flew a little bit and never did take off or something. I don't know for sure what the whole story is about it anymore about the Blue Goose, but. Um, anyway, we went over and went through this big airplane, and, and Linda couldn't go up this as wooden stairs, so she and Steve and Maria and Paul, because Paul was in a stroller, uh, and Linda was in a wheelchair, they went in, and I don't know what they did while we were there, but Howard Hughes was the one that built it, and um, it, it was 
real, real interesting to Dad because he'd read all there was about it. And he even got to sit in the pilot seat and all of this. And this was later moved up to McMinnville, Oregon, but at that time it was down there. And uh, and there was some kind of a park that Michael took us through, and, it was, and he can't remember what it was either, but it was real sandy, and then I know it had lots of different kind of cactus in it. And so uh, we went we went through that, and I think we were probably down, and Michael maybe maybe a couple couple days of three days at the longest, and uh, coming home why we I took a different road because going down why we went through where some cars were still going through the I think I I told before when we went seeing the graduate to the cars that could go through the trees when we run around. Well, coming back, why we went through the, I, I don't know, remember what the name of this place was that we went through, but um, we went up to, I think it was, I know it was called Camp Sherman, but it was one of the redwoods, one of the largest redwoods in the world. And we went up there and uh, they had a tourist trap thing there, of course, and we went in and we ate and so on. When we were in there, why they had a, a tree that they'd cut over, and they showed us all the rains on it, how old this was. And I think it was supposed to, at that time, been over 100 years old that they showed us this. Well, something, some kind of a bug or something bit that on the shoulder and for months and months, I think even years, before he got over that, he even took acupuncture. But anyway, the kids kept telling him that Camp Sherman didn't want to see him. But we went in, and uh, this time uh, we we parked in front of this place again and didn't go through the the cars. But Dad wanted to see one that did, so we sat there and watched till a till a car did go through this tree. And uh, we went through, uh, I think it was, I can't remember the name of the town, to begin with the name, that Mother had a, a uncle that lived there. And uh, Kenny and Dad both said, well, do you want to go see him? And she said, no. She said, he's an old man, he's got an old voice. Well, at the time, Dad was probably in his 80s, and he said, what do you mean an old voice? She laughed, and she said, no, she's been too long, she did one. And so, so we were within just three or four blocks of him, but we didn't see Uncle Howard. We we came on home and then they stayed a couple couple weeks and I think they flew home that time. And Dad didn't like to fly, but he did. Uh, and I mentioned once before that it was time for uh, ANS to take us to Hawaii. And so uh, Viola and I went over and got the tickets from uh, the ticket agency. And everything was fine. We drove to Portland and stayed at a, a hotel so we'd had the car when we came back. And uh, we went out to the airport and everything was fine till we get to up there and come to find out the ticket agent had made a mistake and she put us on the uh, departure time from Seattle rather than Portland and so the plane had left and the first thing they could do was give us the first flight out for Hawaii and the first trip uh, plane we were to have like was supposed to stop at Seattle well when this plane came in we got a straight flight to Hawaii, and all they had was first class. And when we first class, of course, loads loaded first. And when we went in, why the co-pilot was standing right in the doorway into the engine, and I asked him. I said, "Could I look in there? I've never saw the, an engine like that." And he said, "Why, well, yeah, come on in." So he showed me the speedometer and all this stuff. He said, you can even sit, sit in my seat if you want to. I said, no, I don't care to do that. I just wanted to see what it looked like 
in the in the engine of this thing. And so we went back and said, the other three had already got in there and got their seats. And all the way over there, I don't think there was a mile that we didn't either have something in your hand to eat or to drink. And the uh, uh, hostesses couldn't have been nicer. I mean, they, they had slippers first to put on, and at that time they still served a dinner on there. And our dinner was served on, on China rather than what the ones, the regular uh, uh, passengers got. So any anyhow, it, 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 was, it was neat flying over there and the time went really fast. Well, when we got over there, the flight we were supposed to have had, there was supposed to be a, a lay greeting and then they would show us the way to, uh, to uh, or to have our car, because we rented a car, they'd have our car there for us. Well, when we got there, of course, they'd been there earlier and gone. And so we we did get the car. I don't remember how, but we got the car, and we, there was an address on it. And so we drove up to where this address was, and it was one of these places that I, I guess you you check in, you have a key to in, and there's somebody there early in the morning or late at night or what, but anyway, the door was locked. We couldn't, we couldn't get in. So, we, well, what are we gonna do? We, you know, our place is in there, there's nobody here, how are we gonna do it? So we started looking for a motel and by this time it was, oh, I would say it was getting towards late afternoon. And I don't know, we must have stopped at at least four different motels and everything was booked. And so we, we ended up in a residential place. And just as we stopped at the residential place, there was a fellow there mowing the lawn. And he came over to the car and wouldn't know if we were trying to find somebody. so. They told him what had happened, and he said, well, come in the house, and I'll do some calling at a motel and see if we can find you one. And when we got in there, they got to talking, and this family was formerly from Nebraska, and that's where Emil was from. And so uh, we, we were really treated nice, and they had a couple of girls. I imagine they were probably 13 or 14, and they made Viola and I lays out of flowers they went out and picked in the yard. And so they started calling and finally found a place and he told us how to get there. And by this time, why, um, we, we had ate on the plane, so I don't know, I don't think we ate any supper or anything, or they might have gave something to eat at that place, at their house, I don't know. When we got there, why, we went by this uh, lobby and I saw this guy, and I cannot remember his name, but I know that he was on TV all the time, and he had a kind of a floor show, and they sang and so on. So we went in our room, and Viola went on down the hall, and they got uh, a room. And I told Kenny, I said, let's go back down to that lobby. I said, listen to them sing and, and see I can't, whoever he was and see him. So Kenny said, well, I'll run up and tell, Vi uh, tell Amo and Viola that we're going down there, and maybe they'll come down. Well, of course, Amo was ready to go, and Viola had already started putting her hair up. And if she was to want to take them curlers out of her hair and go down there, so we said, okay, but we're, we're, we are. So we went down and uh, saw this performance, and Amo, he came down there too, so... I don't know. I expect we were probably down there an hour. So then the next day, they got to reading on the back of the tickets that that night, and there was a phone number you could call. Uh, and I, I suppose you call this phone number, and then they'd come down there and, and let you in or show you your room or whatever. So we went down, and, and that's what had happened. They, they'd been there, and we weren't there. So anyway, we got our room there, and we were, while we were in Hawaii, we went to uh, four different islands, 
And the first island we went to was the big island. And we went out to, and saw, we took a, what do they call, call it, an, I think a Navy cruiser. And we went out to where Pearl Harbor was. And um, on the outside of this building, there was a uh, fly uh, maps on one side of the wall, and then there was a doorway, and then maps on the other side. And when we had to walk across a, a, a wooden kind of a bridge, and under this kind of the bridge is, and I don't know whether it was the Missouri, I can't remember the name of the ship that was sent there. And at that time, they hadn't raised it yet, and it was still there. And it gave you kind of a funny feeling as you walked across there. Or, and I know it did, Kenny and Amel, as they walked across there to know that all those sailors on that ship were still under there. So we walked in, and they had a, a movie that showed this Pearl Harbor and what had happened and so on. And when we went in there, before we went in, we were looking at this uh, map on one side, and Kenny and Abel were drawn on their line, you know, how we landed and so on, and how it was bombed here and so on. And it had all this down. And right across the, on the other side of the doorway were two Japanese guys, and they were pointing this way. And you just knew they were saying, this is the way we came in. Well, Viola and I knew it was time to get Kenny and, and Alan uh, Able to move away from there because it, it couldn't help but bring back fond memories because both of them had, had been there and Amel had been stationed through there. And so um, anyway, then this uh, boat that we come out on, why it's it circled around on the bay and gave us a ride in the bay before we went back. And... Uh, I don't know, I think the next day we took a trip across, uh, it was somebody's cattle farm and it covered pertinent, oh, I don't know how many acres and uh, of this and then, uh, and I don't know why it's so famous because it was more or less just a road through there. But then that evening, why they had a big luau and that was the first time we tasted poi. And the people in front of us, we were kind of watching them when they had this huge bowl in the middle of a table, and it was poi. And people would just stick their thumb in and eat that. Well, one thumbful was enough for me. It tasted just like you imagine wallpaper pasted taste. It was terrible. But the rest of the, it was good. And that earlier that evening, while we were walking around there, we saw this barbecue thing they had on there, and they had this this pig on there. I guess that's pork, anyway. And it, it was turning, and you could see, and, and it, it was all part of the show because they had on special uniforms and so on. And anyway, we went through this luau, and then they had some native dancers, and they, they had a show. So uh, we saw that that night, and... Then it was time to take the plane to uh, the next island. And I'm not sure, I think it was Maui when we went on, and they told us that we'd heard that if you get one, uh, a pilot happens to be one that was in the war, it's going to be straight up, straight down. It usually takes 10 minutes to fly to that island. But if you happen to get one of these pilots, it would be there in eight. And sure enough, we got one of them. And when they took off, they didn't even hardly do any running, a runway or anything. It was just straight up. You got up and you come just straight down. And, I mean, you could really feel the sensation. I, I was glad when we got off of it. And anyhow, uh, uh, when we went to this island, uh, why uh, one of the things, I, I think that was where they'd had a... Uh, eruption, a volcanic eruptions, and we were asked in a restaurant that day, and Kenny asked uh, this waitress, he said, and you could see the fire burning back, and he says, what do you do when that gets cl closer? 
She says, there's nothing to do. She says, there's no place to go. She said, don't just cover the restaurant so on. She said, you're lucky if you get out with your live. And so uh, we watched this, and we did a lot of uh, sight sewing. They had the painted church there, and I don't know what all we've, we've seen. And uh, then, we, like I say, we went to ch uh, church on Sunday, and when it was over, when we were having breakfast, why this couple was seated next to us, and and come to find out, they told us they were from Seattle, so they come over and joined us, and, and we were talking, and they said, uh, "What are you going to do when you get out of here?" And, oh, I'm just gonna, you know, drive around and sightsee. And they said, "Well, if you want to, uh, we'll take you out to our friends." They said, "They're Japanese." And they grow the most beautiful orchids you can imagine. And they'll show you their house, because I bet you've never seen anything like it. So we followed them out to this Japanese place, a Japanese house. And it was kind of more or less just like a, it, 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 you can't say it was a hut, but it, it was like a, a real built house either. And, but at the front of it, where we went in, and it was like a big solarium sunroom. And I think they had probably every kind of an orchid you can imagine in there. And they were huge. They were huge orchids. But it was real uh, humidity in there. It was just kind of a hot, damp thing. And, of course, all over his yard outside, there was all kinds of flowers. Everything, everything was flowers. And so at the... At the end of this uh, sunroom or what it was, there was dirt. And it, it was kind of a hill-like thing, and he was growing uh, those bong, what are those trees? Bong, 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 bong guy or whatever it is, anyway. He was growing those, and it was like, uh, and it, it was a wide, it was a wide spot, I would say, uh, Probably, the first one was probably four feet out uh, high, and then it dropped down about a foot. And then another layer of flowers. Anyhow, he had three three of these tiers. And the uh, first flowers up there were taller, and then the, they were shorter and shorter. I don't mean flowers, I mean trees. Small guy. And he had them uh, tapered and shaped in different ways. And he said... That's just, they're handed down from generation to generation. And uh, Emil said, well, would you sell one of those? And he said, I wouldn't sell one. And he couldn't hardly t understand. And he'd say, not for a million, not for a million. And so then, uh, then we were invited into the next room. We went into his house. And about all that was in there was a, a huge tub and there was um, robes hanging around there, and it looked like a, a bath, a bathtub, and, and it was. And and the fellow that was with us told us that that uh, when they get ready to take a bath, they get in this tub first and wash. And of course, they work out in the yard a lot, and they got dirt on them. And I guess. That's like any bath water. When they're through with it, it's drained. But when you go from that room into the next room, and that one looked like a, a bathroom. It looked like a, a garden tub. I mean, it was it was huge, and you could smell the perfumes and fragrance when you when you walked in there. So after you get this first tub, then you go in and you get in the next tub. And that tub, well, they told us that. Uh, they only uh, put fresh water in there about, oh, once a month. And they had a uh, some kind of wood underneath it, and they'd heat that, set that on fire, and that'd heat that water. And from there, they went into a, a, a room that was, was their kitchen, or, or eating room, I guess, everything. And no chairs, nothing. You sat on the floor to eat. And I don't know what they ate, they never told us, but uh, they had over in one corner, there was a thing like, uh, 
I think that uh, I mentioned it before when Michael Japan how they pulled up the that uh, it wasn't a tea kettle but it was a pot that they, it was always had water in it so whenever you wanted tea your tea your tea was ready and they did offer us tea we had tea and some kind of little cookies I don't know what they were but uh, this was one of the most interesting places I think that that we saw over there that uh, and uh, they had kimonos in this room just hanging around so you could see that they still were doing the the Japanese thought and, and for some reason I guess it was what we were seeing that couple didn't bother uh, Kenny and Abel when they, when, when they were there and when we were sitting there while we were talking about teak plants plants and uh, how many of those teak trees there were and I I guess I was over looking looking at him and he, he when he talked to us it'd be like one word at a time and he'd say he said want one and and I had intended to buy one you know on the way home because well, that's it out there and he said uh, want one and I said well yeah he said, come, come. He took this big machete. And why I ever went with him, I don't know. But anyway, he, he went ahead. He had just little sandals on. We just went padding out through where we came from and out behind kind of a shed building. And there, there were these trees were just all over. And he went over and he whacked, whacked them off. He said, uh... And I don't know how he told me, he told her because he did. He told me, he said, when you get back to the a hotel room, when you, you get ready to keep in water to your fly. And he said, then wrap it in a tissue in a newspaper and hide, hide. And he meant put under the, your clothes. So when you went through customs, they didn't show. Well, I don't think we even went cut through customs. But anyhow... I got home with my plants, and the only difference between this and what I'd have paid at the airport or someplace that it was stamped that it had been through, I, I suppose, so they wouldn't be bringing anything back or forth or so on. But they, we found out later that they ship a lot of plants back and forth, and they don't go through that. They'll just send them to the florist here. So anyway, when we left that island, we went to... Kenny's favorite island, Kauai. And when we were drove, driving to the airport, there was a, a big rock, and they noticed it ahead of time, and it was the outline of a John Kennedy. It looked just, I don't know whether it had been carved, but they said it wasn't. It was said it was just natural. And when you get your, just a certain place in your car, it looked, it was just a spitting image of John Kennedy. Well, anyway, we got on the plane and and then went to Kauai and uh, Garden Island. And I think that was the prettiest motel that, that we ever stayed in. It was a bright yellow, and all around in front of it was red uh, rhododendrons or orchids. There were just all kinds of flowers. And you opened that door and you went and went in, and there was the living place. And most of these motels we were in, there were they were one one bedroom hotels, but they had hideaway uh, beds that you could pull out at night. So we took turns. One night, one couple of us had had the bedroom, and the other one would be on the hideaway bed. The next day, turn it the other way. So, so this was this was great. Well, anyway, when we were in. Uh, Kauai, when you looked out through there, there was this huge, huge garden. They, we even saw a couple of weddings while we were there. And when you went through, it walked across the lawn. Then you went down some steps, and there was a sandy beach. And it wasn't, it was long, but it wasn't too, too, too far to the ocean. And so uh, in the evening, why we'd go swimming or, let's say, wading in the ocean, and I think that's the one that uh, I think one day we were swimming out there and there were 
I was playing around in the water out there, and a wave came in and dumped Kenny on his head. And I, I think he had kind of a slight concussion because he had a headache for a couple of days. But anyway, he had a, a camera. They were taking pictures. And I was out there, and there was, oh, I don't know, five or six boys about, oh, six or seven years old. And when they saw that, they'd say, pictures, pictures. And so I got, my, and I don't know whatever happened to that picture, but I had my picture taken with all these little boys around there, and they were hopping around, and they were saying, movie, movie, movie. <laughs> and so evidently there had been other people taking their pictures and so on. Uh, one of the places we went there, we took a uh, boat ride up some kind of a, a a little river or bay, and it was I it, it was still it, it wasn't dark yet when we started down there, but the, where we went there were trees on both sides back a distance, but it, it was just beautiful. And then when we got to, to the end of it, it wasn't the luau they had, but it was some place that you could you could eat and. Uh, and, I mean, they served us, served us dinner and so on. It wasn't dinner, it was just kind of a, what do I want to say, kind of a smorgasbord thing, just, you know, it was more, more the scenery we saw than anything. And then we got, got back, and I forget the name of the other island, Molokai, it wasn't Molokai. But anyway, we saw four of them, and... Um, can't remember. Oh, one island we went to, and I don't remember which one it was. Viola and I wanted to do some shopping, and I don't think we bought a thing, but while we were doing this, they were having uh, some kind of a, a fish derby, and Kenny and Amel were down there watching them, and they'd bring in these great big ship uh, fish and wham. And while they were down there, why well, it it started raining and they there was a huge huge tree I don't know what kind of a tree it was, and they ran over and got underneath it, and Viola and I were, were up in one of these shops, and we must have been up there a half an hour, uh, watching these people and, and they were they were running in all directions to get under under these trees, but most of them that were doing the running was tourists, because it didn't bother the. The native people that lived lived there at all. Uh, well, we were over there pretty much every morning. We would have fruit and a piece of toast, and then we would either have uh, a lunch, or else we'd have an early dinner. We we'd eat out at least at least once a day, and so when it was time to go home, why? We went back to the airport, and Emil said, well, let's see how much it is to upgrade to fly back first class since we come over first class. Well, we didn't think that ANS needed to make the, make the jump because it, it was pretty, pretty good. And so we flew back, and then I expect maybe it was probably four years, five years later, why, uh, Larry Stratton and Joy had never been there, and they wanted to go, so we did. We said, well, the four of us would go. Well, before we went, Amos and another couple, Ruth and Lou Hoffman, decided to go with us. Well, to tell the truth, four couples is too many to go together. And before we went, we'd agreed, well, if, if one couple wants to do something, they can do it. We don't need to do everything together. Well, first thing, instead of going to to uh, Seattle, like we always did, we flew to California, and there was a shortage of, uh, of, of uh, seats. And if you get up, give up your seat, why uh, they would give you a free ticket to go back again. Of course, Amos and us wanted to do it right away. Larry and Joy didn't want to do it first way. And then they got thinking, well, maybe it is a good idea. Well, by the time we went to do it, of course, that had already been filled. That was the first first morning. 
Okay, then when we got over there, why, uh, we rented a, I think it was a, a van, and, and we got to our motel, which, which was fine, and we traveled around that day. I don't remember which island. I guess maybe it was the big island. And uh, of course, Amos and us had been there before. Well, r rather than take the uh, the military boat out like like we'd done, where well, they wanted to take, and, and it was it was free, but it was a I guess you'd call it a yacht, and we rode it out, and it was crowded, and so on, and we we got there, and uh, they had added two. Uh, places that you could walk up and down and see. Well, we all went in again, and uh, the other two couples didn't want to see the movie. We'd already seen it, so, well, okay, we did. So our trip to Pearl Harbor that time wasn't near, near like the first time, but that's our, that was all right. We went to uh, a luau that night, and... I don't know whether it's that island or not, but they heard the Hilo Hattie. And they went to go out to Hilo Hattie's. So we all decided to go out to Hilo Hattie's. And, and that's where they sold all kinds of uh, uh, clothes, shorts. and uh, So the guys all bought shirts and they matched our, our uh, formals. And the first time that Amos and us went out, we took a, a cruise at, at night. It wasn't really a cruise. It was just a little float around in the bay. And, and we ate on it, and, and they had a little floor show, and, and we just kind of uh, cruised around. But then, I don't know, we were at another island with Amos, and we went to to this dinner cruise, and, and we were out on the uh, ocean probably a good three hours. They sailed all around, and they had a, a formal uh, dinner for us, and and uh, then they had a little dancer, and she come and danced on our table, and she had her sarong on, but then she had another skirt over the top, and she flung it over her and, Ed, and Amos' head. And, and she was dancing all the time that she was stooped over like this. <laughs> and I don't know, it was, it was just seconds that she was in, under there and so on. Of course, everybody was clapping and clapping. And she was waving and going on, off on like this. And she was young, I suppose. I suppose she was in her 20s. I don't know, but they looked so young. And, and then, then if you went to go to the bathroom, why... You went over, and it, it was in one corner of this. I guess I guess you'd call it a yacht, and uh, you had to go down about four or five uh, steps. Well, they weren't stairs; they were steps. You had to go down, and the only difference between yours and the men's restroom was just a curtain. But there was a little fella up there that it would only let one person at a time go down. And then he, uh, on, on the other side, well, but he did let Viola and I go down together, I guess. And we just got started down the stairs, and we heard him dancing. And we'd seen him do this before. You'd go down, and he'd shut the lid, and you were just like you were in a can. And he was standing up here dancing. And I told Viola, "What if he don't want to let us out?" <laughs> and anyway, we got down and up. And then uh, we hadn't been out there too long after dinner, and everybody get in a circle. So we started walking around, or supposed to be dancing around this big, I don't know what it was in the middle of the, in the middle of the the yacht. I guess it was just the the floorboards. And any, anyway, we went or danced around that two or three times, and then you could dance if you wanted to, or you could sit whatever you wanted to. So. This was a good time. Well, when uh, the four of us went there, they didn't want to go on a cruise. So, well, that was all right. And it, it just seemed like 
uh, when we went to eat, why, well, of course, again, we ate breakfast and so on, but uh, they didn't want to eat again until we'd go to a deli and get stuff and go back to the room, and then if we wanted to go out in the evening, we did and so on, but they never, they never wanted to go to a restaurant. It was always this deli food, and uh, I, I always get pretty tired of deli food. She went to dinner. So we said, well, well let's, let's go to dinner. No, they didn't want to go to dinner. So the four of us went to dinner. That did not suit very well, but we didn't care. We, a and S took us to took us to dinner. We went to a for, pretty formal place. We dressed up and went. We got back. Why? They were they were they were a little bit cool that night. We were, played cards and so on, and and more or less stayed in. Well, then we went to the next island, and it was Kenneth's and my anniversary, and. Um, When we went back, why uh, we stopped at uh, uh, the restaurant in Kenny Bar or I don't mean restaurant, uh, well, grocery store someplace, I don't know. Anyway, he bought a couple of bottles of champagne and a bottle of uh, sparkling water. So he said, knowing them, one of them will decide they don't like champagne. But he says, we're going to have a drink of champagne tonight. So. When, when we, all four of us got back there, or eight of us got back there, we went in, and there was a great big basket of fruit. And it had a bottle of champagne and all kinds of pastries and so on. Christ, right away, I blamed Emil of Violin. Violin knew nothing about it. And of course the other didn't. I said, well, some somebody knew because it had an anniversary card and all of this on it. Well, come to find out, the kids and, and Emil had got together before we went over there, and he arranged for, for the time and the place, and the ki kids had this basket. And I, I don't know whether they, ha they had it ordered, I guess, from there. And, of course, we were all, all surprised. Well, then... Larry found out that Larry, uh, that Emil knew about it, and then he was out of sorts that he didn't know about it. And do you know that he would not eat one bite of fruit? He didn't, uh, he didn't hurt anybody himself, but he never, he never, and we couldn't begin to eat all the fruit. And uh, I think we were there two or three days. Of course, we couldn't take it, uh, any of it with us, but. We did take some of the fruit with us, but left the basket and so on. And after, you know, Emil said, you know, the kids did it. Well, we thought, well, you know, everything will be fine. Well, Emil, or Larry held that grudge, I think, the whole time we were there. Well, we drove, we drove around uh, at a sightseeing and partnered every island we'd been at. Why, uh, Larry? He couldn't see very well, so he didn't drive. And Lou, he'd never been there before, and he wasn't the best driver in the world. And but uh, so uh, Stratton rode with us, and Amos and them rode together. Well, one day they decided that they wanted to go together. So Amos Files said, "Okay, fine." Oh. There was one turn that you had to turn to go to our place, and every time we'd go around, Lou would be in the wrong lane, and I think we went around that big intersection about four or five times before he ever got in the right place. And there was a lot of sugar cane there, and you had to watch pretty close or you'd, or you'd miss it. And uh, I don't know, it it just it just did not work too well with. Uh, four people going around and around. Um, so that was the end of that. Well, another place we went to was uh, Patty and Marv Weber. We'd met the, them at the lodge and we'd become pretty close friends with them. And 
Glenn and Barbara Rear. Well, uh, when we were going back to uh, Branson for the Navy convention back there, we'd go one year. The next year, we went up to Farragut, Idaho, and that's where Kitty uh, was stationed and where Marv went through boot camp. And uh, <clears throat> sometimes Mother'd go with us, and after her Mother was by herself, she'd go up and stay at Leona's, and we'd go out uh, on to Farragut, Idaho. And uh, that, that was strictly na Navy. Kenny and I went up there the first time by ourselves. We were in the motor home. And uh, they, they had a, a show, and they, they had a, a dance. Well, it, it was kind of cold up there that year. People were sitting around wrapped up in blankets, and I think there were only six couples of us that did any dancing at all. But they decided or, or the next day was a picnic, and you never saw a picnic lunch put together so fast in your life, or a potluck, I should say. Uh, all the people that were there brought it with them and put it out right away, and there was anything and everything that you could imagine to eat. Well, anyway, we went by ourselves, and then uh, two years later, Patty and Marv went with us, and oh, we had we had a great time. There was. Uh, a dance place right down the road at Athol, they called it. And in the afternoon, they'd have a, a, a show out, out on the stage. And then at night, they'd have this dance up at Athol. And uh, in the meantime, they had, oh, I don't know, lots of different things you could do. They weren't really uh, fair booths or something, but it, it was... You could shop around or you could, most of the time they just sat in the pavilion and visited her. And the men kind of got together, and probably talked to old times and so on. Uh, we, t we took a boat ride up the river and so on. And then there was uh, a place down the road and, and, and it was a, a little town and we went down there. And uh, they they had a place you could you could eat or uh, go through town and so on. So we used to go down there and uh, the bathroom. When you went in the bathroom, uh, and, and the women's side was all pictures of uh, what's his name, Selleck, Tom Selleck. He had big big posters of Tom Selleck all over. His, the Wall, and I don't know, two or three other movie stars. And they also had, uh, kind of like, I suppose maybe they were supposed to be Adam and Eve, or I don't know. But anyway, from, from uh, the waist up, this fellow was, uh, didn't have any shirt or anything on. And in front of, uh, of him was all this greenery and so on. Well, if you moved the greenery, which some, somebody had to be curious for every time we were in there. And the minute they moved this uh, foliage around, the bells would start ringing <laughs> everywhere. The people on the outside would know that, <laughs> that you moved the, the foliage back and forth. And <clears throat> I, 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 the men's restaurant, room, I, I, I guess was all right, because the guys never said anything about it, but you could, you could tell that, oh, that was the, I forget, I'll, I'll think about it later. They, they had something in the, oh, on the outside of the bathrooms. They had this thing, and then they were setters or pointers, <laughs> and that, that that was what it was, men and women. And you, where, where do you go? Well, of course, you know, if you stop to think at all, you're all right. But sometimes if you made a mistake, the bells would start ringing. You never knew, you never knew what kind of a trap you were going to 
walking in this whole big, well, it was an outdoor restaurant place, and it, it was more or less just kind of a fun house type thing. And uh, like I say, Patty and our uh, Marvin, us, we went up uh, on this boat ride, and uh, Kenny had never been a whoever it is that guides the boat. He, uh, when he was sent to boot camp up there, that's what they had him do. Well, he, I guess he had to learn how to do it. And Marv, I don't know what they had him doing, but he he didn't uh, know how to swim, and uh, and he had had something to do with the swimming. But so, anyway, I guess they they learned how and. We went. We went up and down this 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 river, Renlet or whatever it was. And they said, they can't imagine that Eleanor Roosevelt chose this place for a, a cab. They had uh, oh, different uh, things that they had when they were in service up there, and so on. And then the. Two years later, why uh, Barbara and Glenn went with us, and the four of us went. And the first time, uh oh, oh, that that time, uh, Patty and Marv had bought a, a motor home, and I don't. Oh, Glenn and Barbara, I think t took their rig too, or maybe they. No, I don't think they stayed with us. I think they took their rig, and. The six of us went up there, and they had the jail, the, the brig that was there when the guys were stationed there. And, of course, we went in through the the brig, and the guy that was kind of in charge in there come over and locked the door, or shut the door, I guess is probably all he did. Anyhow, we got our pictures taken, all six of us in the brig, and so on, and Anyway, um, we did the same thing, and we went to a dance down there to this place, and, and they had the old-fashioned dances where you'd circle, you know, an element left to dance with your partner. So I was dancing with this one fella, and uh, I couldn't find out he was from Bend. And I told him, well, that's where my son lived, that he was uh, CEO of this credit union. I said, stop in and tell him hello sometime. And he said, I'll do that. Well, after the reunion was over, he went back and he walked in the credit union. And, of course, one of the tellers wanted to know if they could help him or something. And, well, he wanted to talk to the CEO and talk to Bill Anderson. And Bill said, I came a-stepping down. I thought it was somebody maybe that wanted to make a loan or somebody that was complaining or something. So he walked up over to him and asked him if he could help him. And he said, uh, I was in um, Spokane, or Farragut, last weekend. And he says, I danced with your mother. And he turned around and walked out. <laughs> Bill said, he never, never talked to me at all. He just said, I danced with your mother. <laughs> Bill said, I thought, well, fine. <laughs> that, that, that's all right, I guess. And so, so uh, we went. We went back, and and when we went home, boy, we went uh, kind of back through the countryside, and there was several casinos. So we stopped at two or three uh, the casinos before we uh, drove back home. And I think that probably uh, Patty and Marv and us went up there. Three or four times, and I, and I know that Glenn and Barbara went up there twice with us. So, uh, and Mother used, uh, after Dad was gone, my mother would stay in, in uh, Spokane. And uh, then we'd come back and stay there. And one time we drove on up to a town, and I can't remember the name of it. But they had boats and ships. Uh, ships could come in there, and we saw them. And, and they would go across into Canada, but we never, we never ever, ever, ever done that with us. Okay.